So, um, who are the kids on the cover? Dawn doesn't babysit any girls in this book, and she certainly doesn't take them with her on a date. That would be a bad idea. Also a bad idea? Fast food restaurants having vases when kids are running around. Argofunk book review, Argofunk book review. This book was written by Mary Lou Kennedy. I liked her last book because it minimized the recaps. This book goes back to the standard of multiple recap chapters, and I'm sad. The Babysitter's Club has a sleepover at Christie's house, and they give each other crazy makeovers. They look like slobs when they stumble downstairs for breakfast the next morning. That's unfortunate, because HOT GUY ALERT! Travis the Dreamboat is there, visiting Christie's older brothers. Dawn instantly falls in love with him because he's gorgeous and they're both from California! They talk for a half hour about California things, like granola and how much they miss the ocean. What? Granola is a California thing? A and how do they miss the ocean? Super Special 4 says that Stony Brook has beaches that are right on the ocean. Continuity! A week later, Travis shows up at Dawn's house unannounced. Uh, how did he learn where she lives? That's creepy, just showing up at the house of a girl you talked to once. They talk about cars in high school for a while, at least he talks about them, while Dawn pretends to know what cars are. Then he gets even creepier by giving her presents, first a necklace and second are some combs. He thinks Dawn would look great if she combed her hair back and trimmed it a few inches. As soon as he's gone, Dawn yells at Marianne to get a brush and scissors, because they're going to... completely ignore the haircut stuff and never mention it again. Who cares if Dawn cuts her hair? We need to hear about babysitting! Our plot kid today is James Hobart, who's doing a play with the Perkins girls. Only Zack the Bully keeps interrupting and telling James what to do. Zack is a huge jerk, and everybody wonders why James puts up with him. Four days later, Travis picks Dawn up from school. They get food at a burger place where he orders grilled cheese sandwiches for both of them. Hmm, that doesn't look like grilled cheese. And why did he get himself a bigger drink than her? Dawn spaces out while he talks about sports, and she just stares at his handsome face instead of listening. Then they go shopping. He buys her some earrings, which he thinks would be great at the top of her ears. Dawn isn't so keen on the idea of punching new holes in her ears because some guy said so, even if that guy is super hot. Dawn goes home, and hey, Mom and Richard aren't so keen on the idea of Dawn spending the whole afternoon with an older boy they don't know, even if that guy is super hot. Mom thinks it's weird for a guy you barely know to shower you with presents, while Richard thinks it's weird for a 16-year-old high schooler to be hitting on an 8th grader all the time. They're both right. The parents ask to meet Travis so they can decide if they'll let the relationship continue. Sadly, just like Dawn cutting her hair, this subplot is dropped immediately, and we never hear about it again. We know that Christy isn't a gossip, but for the sake of the story, she is! She starts gossiping about how Travis is going out with this fantastic-looking swimmer girl. Dawn is bothered by this, so she goes to high school to spy on Travis. Good thing the high school is next door, even though it was all the way across town in book 33. CONTINUITY! Travis is with a gorgeous redhead. He takes her to the burger place, buys her earrings, and he kisses her in the park. Dawn is crushed! Travis doesn't like her! He was in love with a high school girl the whole time! Then what was he doing with Dawn? Was that just a practice date before going out with his girlfriend? Because he did the exact same things in the exact same order on both dates. Hmm... I don't know what's going on, but I think it's creepy! You're creepy, Travis! Stop it! James puts on his play, which was cute, and again, Zack ruins everything by bossing James around. Marianne realizes this is just like Travis! He is always bossing Dawn around. So, everybody learns a lesson about being an individual instead of letting boys boss you around. Dawn decides to get revenge on Travis by purposely interrupting his next date with his girlfriend. Both Travis and his girlfriend are pretty nonchalant about it, which obviously is not good enough. He was supposed to be incredibly embarrassed and break down crying. So, Dawn calls him on the phone. 
how did she get his phone number? I, uh, whatever. She calls him on the phone and she reads him the riot act for trying to change her, turning her into somebody she's not. You can't imagine what a big effect you had on me. I took everything you said to heart. Maybe you can't understand this, Travis, but I practically run around in circles trying to please you. I tried so hard to be everything you wanted me to be. Travis says this is a huge overreaction to him suggesting that she wear combs in her hair, and she hangs up without giving him a chance to explain anything. The rest of the book is Dawn writing letters to Lewis, who is Logan's cousin. He seems nice, and they're going to meet in book 50, which is over a year from now, so I'll probably forget all about him by then. The end. Post-book follow-up. I thought this book was really inconsistent, and not just because it drops the haircut and parent subplots. I thought that the ending doesn't fit the story at all. In the end, they decide that Travis is a horrible, bossy person who is trying to control Dawn and never let her do anything on her own. But that's not at all the vibe that I got from him. Like, he said she should style her hair a different way. She didn't, and he was perfectly fine with that. She refused to get her ears pierced, and again, he didn't have a problem with it. That is not controlling bossy person! He was totally fine with her not following his suggestions! Now, he did control the conversations with Dawn, but that's mainly because she checked out of them, and she pretended to know about cars and sports. I thought that was a bad move on Dawn's part. She made him think that she knows all about cars, and then she gets mad when he talks to her about cars. That's what I'm trying to get at when I say the book is inconsistent. The moral at the end of the story about being independent and thinking for yourself, that's a good moral, no question. But it doesn't match this book where Dawn is independent and thinks for herself. She pretty much learned the lesson that she should act the same way she always acts. I mentioned a few times that Travis is creepy. I wish Dawn hadn't cut him off at the end because I really wanted an explanation for Travis's behavior. Why did he shower so much attention on Dawn, a girl that he only met once? It's highly questionable if he ever had any romantic interest in her, especially since he had a girlfriend the entire time. The book tries to say he was only interested in changing her, but again, why would he do that? Why get so invested in shaping someone you don't know or care about? Overall, I didn't like this book. It's jarring how the book's message is so disconnected from the book's content. And Travis's behavior is nothing but confusing and creepy to me. The subplot about the play was great. That was great. That was cute, funny, I liked it. But the rest of the book is... I just don't get it! I'm glad that Dawn's faux relationship with Travis is over, and I don't have to try understanding this guy anymore. I get Babysitter's Club number 37, Dawn and the Older Boy... A 3 out of 10.